If you want to turn to your Bibles, if you have one, then please do. We're going to turn to Mark chapter 12. During this season of generosity and gratitude, we're, we're going, if you have like an old family Bible that you have or that you got when you were a kid or maybe a parent or loved one gave it to you, maybe you have, you have red letters in that Bible maybe. And if you do, those are the teachings of Jesus. So I like to call that the Bible inside the Bible because this is what Jesus has said. He is the Lord. He is the Savior. He is, you know, God on earth and God with us. And so when we see those red letters, we know he's talking to us. And we know this is something I need to put to practice or live or understand in my life. And so today and throughout this month, we're going straight to the red letters to get as close as we can into the mind and the heart of Jesus as he thinks about generosity and what it means to be generous and grateful people. So let me share this with you. A reading from Mark chapter 12, beginning verse 41. Jesus sat down in the temple opposite of the treasury, which was a box inside the temple. Instead of offering plates like were passed around, there was a box, and you could go to this box and it had a hole in it, and you could put your offerings in the box. It was called the treasury. At the temple, Jesus sat down opposite the treasury, and he watched the crowd putting money into it. Many rich people came came by, and they put large sums of money into the box. They probably had to put some in, and then put some in, and put some in, or, or maybe roll it up really tight so that it would slip in there. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow then came and put in two small copper coins. Two tiny coins, which are worth about a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I want you to imagine a a young dad, I think of young, 44 years old, who has a couple of kids. I'm not thinking about anybody in particular. And the kids have a great weekend. They go see a relative out of town who takes them to all these cool things everywhere. And you know, just like a great weekend, movies, the fair, the this, the that, the great food, your favorite food, all day, day stay up late, everything great. All right, just like imagine, like the, the greatest weekend for kids ever. And then they come home from that event and immediately just walking in the door, already bickering, arguing over who gets to pick the TV show, who, who gets the best cereal. There's only enough, you know, of the Frosted Flakes left and someone else is going to have to eat the kicks, okay? And so there's ar- arguing over that. Or, or who gets to, to have, you know, the chair at the table that's the favorite chair at the table? And, and maybe you as a parent, your, your head's about to explode because it's striking you that they just had all this awesome stuff happening and like there's no gratitude even for a moment, but instantly bickering. I know none of you have ever experienced this before, all right? Maybe some of you have. I'm not thinking of anybody in particular, you know. But one time that happened to me, and I was struck by how much it is our natural tendency, left uncorrected, left undirected, to drift every single day more and more and more into ingratitude. As adults, as children, Our human nature, our natural brokenness, what I like to call the human condition, is to take for granted what we have, to not be intentional about gratitude. But without correction, without being redirected, without someone kind of grabbing us like I need routinely, we are not focused or intentional about thinking about all that we have from God, much less telling God. When was the last time you you exerted yourself not in a perfunctory way, not in a rote way, that you really exerted yourself in thinking about all the things that God has put into your life. When was the last time that you really, really pushed through the obvious, oh, my family and this, to to think about all the blessings throughout your life? 
that God's poured into your life? When was the last time that you exerted yourself in that? As compared to when was the last time you thought about what you don't have <laughs> and what you wish you had or, or what you wish you could buy? It's our human nature to drift towards. It's like a gravitational force that exists as part of our sin nature that pulls us to being not generous people. Jesus is addressing this in kind of a unique way when he's sitting in the temple with his disciples. I got to say, I'm reading this, I'm thinking, Jesus is a terrible fundraiser, all right? I mean, fired. He is not the director of development that you want to hire for your organization. Because if he was... He would see these big donors, and he would say, man, you know, write down their name. Hey, Mark, write their names down. They got big money. Write their names. Where do they live? You got their email address? All right. Put them into our follow-up program, uh, you know, our constant contact program. We're going to follow up, find out what they're interested in. We're going to connect with them through their interests, and then we're going to, you know, lead them. We're going to deepen this relationship with those folks. You know, it would have been, you know, they would have had a real plan. You know, for how to connect with the, the big money givers. But Jesus instead draws their attention to someone who was invisible. Now we, we read this and we miss that. But in Jesus' day, a woman, and certainly a widow, invisible. Invisible. No power, no money, couldn't own property, couldn't do anything, had no legal rights, had no legal standing without a male in her life. This was someone who was invisible. Invisible. I imagine someone stooped over. I imagine someone taking two little coins in her hand. I imagine her looking at them and thinking, well, it's either eat or give. That's kind of a big decision. I've never had to make a decision like that. Maybe some of you have. Probably some of you have. I haven't, so I won't pretend otherwise. But this woman looked at those coins and thought, it's either eat or give. She put them in. I imagine Jesus tearing up. The disciples oblivious to all this, thinking, what in the world? What's up, what's up with him? I imagine Jesus' heart breaking. I imagine the rest of the story is that Jesus said, hey, hey, John, go to her house later tonight and make sure she has more than she has had in weeks. Jesus was so touched by this woman because she gave out of poverty. People that day were giving, and some giving a lot, but giving in a way that didn't cost anything, you know? They had excess, they had abundance. And they gave out of that abundance, which was a good thing to give. It was a good thing. They gave, period, they gave. And so Jesus wasn't condemning the big gifts from people who had a lot of extra, but he was lifting up the invisible, lifting up this woman who was giving everything, even though she had nothing. Think about that. She had nothing, and she gave everything. And the reason why this touched Jesus so much was because this foreshadowed the cross. We miss that, that what Jesus saw in this experience was a glimpse of the cross. You know, Jesus was homeless. Jesus had no place to live. He said, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He had nothing. He, he accumulated nothing. He didn't have a storage unit, right? He didn't have a bank account. He wasn't about accumulation for himself. He was about accumulating in others. And, and so here's a man who on the cross had nothing but gave everything, right? And he sees in this woman, he sees a glimpse, he sees a hint he sees a foreshadowing of the cross itself. He sees someone who has nothing and painfully, painfully, sacrificially gives everything. Is that the cross? Someone who has nothing but painfully, sacrificially, 
at cost to herself, gives everything. And in her, he sees God. He sees God. God who gave his son. Jesus who gave his life. And he said, this is holy. You know, like Moses and God telling Moses, take your, feet, your shoes off. Don't take your feet off. Take your shoes off. Be a real mess, wouldn't it? Take your shoes off. You're standing on holy ground. I feel like Jesus was looking at this woman and saying, this is holy. Did you see that? She had nothing. She gave everything. This has been on my mind because as a dad, I want to teach generosity to my kids. If you're a parent or a grandparent or a great-grandparent, if you're an uncle or a friend or someone who has young friends, maybe it's occurred to you the opportunity that you have to shape generosity in a young person. This is on my heart as a dad. I hope it's on your heart as a mom or dad or a grandmother or a granddad. This is your calling. This is you preparing someone to be the kind of person that God wants and needs in the world. And so it's on my heart, how do I teach that to my children? How do I teach generosity? What legacy am I leaving so that when my kids think about me, what do they think? What comes to mind as, as what he stood for, what he did or lived in the world? The older you get past 40, when you hit the back nine, what I call the back nine, you start thinking about that. When you make the turn <laughs> and you're on that back nine, you start thinking about that. Julia hates it when I say this, you know, when, when I say, well, I'm halfway home now, <laughs> you know, you start thinking about legacy. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Another way of thinking about it is trajectory. What trajectory are you launching the young people in your life on? Because the direction of your life is the trajectory that you set them on. What trajectory are you sending them off on? More generous, more loving of God, more grateful. That's what's on my heart. And I want them to have that because it's God-honoring, but it's also life-filling. The best, most filled feelings I've ever had in my life were in moments of giving. Winston Churchill, I think, maybe put it best when he said, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life out of what we give. Yeah, you make a living out of what you get. And you can be, have a living and be empty inside and be sad and unhappy. We make a life out of what we give. Generosity is kindness that you can touch. Right? Kindness, you may think of it as like smiling at someone, being nice, having good, warm feelings. You can't touch that. Right? Generosity is kindness you can touch. You can eat it. If you're hungry, it'll put a roof over your head if you don't have one. It'll give you hope when you're in despair. Generosity is kindness that you can touch. And I want my children and their children to have that generosity, A, because it's God-loving, but B, because and science confirms this, the best science, the best research, brain research, neural research in the mind, because generosity creates happiness in the brain. Amazing scans are done at what happens in the brain. Something changes in your brain chemistry when you are generous with someone else. Did you know that? Those of you who like to Google everything, Google this. Generosity is one of the most surefire ways to make yourself happy is, is not by getting, but by giving. It changes the brain. And I want that for the people in my life. And I've learned that the way there is actually not that complicated. How do we get there? If that's so good, wait, how do we get there? How do we be more like Jesus in that way? And I'm going to tell you something really easy. The starting line for the race of generosity is gratitude. No gratitude, no generosity. Much, much gratitude, much generosity. Think, think about two people who are looking at the same thing. One person's grateful, one person's not grateful. They look at the same thing, and the grateful person looks at what they have, and they have this sense of abundance. Like, holy moly, look what I've got. 
I can't believe it. Look at this. This is awesome. Thank you, God. Thank you for what I've got, man. This is great. Their worldview is abundance. The other person looks at the same thing. They're not grateful. And what they see is scarcity. They see what they don't have but wish they did. They see what someone else has but what they don't have. They don't see what they have. They see what they don't have. They're looking at the same thing, people. But gratitude, you see what you have, how blessed you are. Ingratitude, you see what you don't have. And when you see what you have and you have that sense of abundance, you think, I've got more than I need. I want to share. I want to bless somebody else with this. It turns us to God because we, when we're grateful, we can't help but look up. You don't look at yourself when you're grateful. You look up to God. You say, God, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And you're inspired to share and to give. Here, here's an easy way to bring this home. And I shared with you about these generosity jars. They're pretty cool. Thankful to the Harmons for making these for us. But around the table, you know, sometimes in my house it's like, uh, hey, what'd you do today? Nothing. Anybody ever get that answer? Oh, everybody. Okay, good. I feel a little bit better. I'm glad y'all told me. It doesn't work for you either. What'd you do today? Nothing. How was it? Oh, it's okay. What if we change that to be, what are you thankful for to God today? What has God done for you today? So instead of looking at ourselves, we're looking to God. Where have you seen God today? Imagine if I put this on my table and not only did I read through them in the next few weeks, but then I left it there to remind me, instead of saying, wait, you know, what'd you do today? Say, hey, what are you thankful to God for today? Where did you see God today? How has God blessed you today? You know, the, the obvious next thing then say, well, did you tell him? Heck, let's tell him right now. And to foster in our homes that sense of gratitude to God, which I think is the soil in which generosity grows. We talk about it. And then we go beyond talking about it to doing it with them. Did anybody grow up watching Peanuts, a cartoon? All right. So every now and then when I'm talking to my kids about something, I have this flashback to Peanuts. All right, take a look. Maybe you can recognize this. one that ever has that feeling <laughs> that I didn't know my voice sounded like that. Wah, 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 wah. And so it's not enough to just talk about it. That's important. We teach and we shape with what we say. And when we say it, our kids might remember it. But when we do it as a family, they become it. Remember that. When you hear, what you hear, you might remember. But what you do, you become. Talking about it only gets you so far. Unless you're doing it with them. What you say, they may remember. But what they do, they will become. So things like rise against hunger matter. They matter. Because there are opportunities for us to do and to put into practice these things that are life-changing, that shape who we are. And we can do that with our families, not as a one-off every year so that we feel good about ourselves, but making that a regular part of our family lifestyle. How are we serving others? How are we being generous with other people? Involving our children, involving our families, involving our friends, maybe involving our coworkers in being servants to other people. Because what you do is what you become. What you hear, you may remember, but what you do is what you become. But I've learned as a dad that not only do I need to teach generosity, not only do I need to show it, but also need to be ready to learn it from my kids. That sometimes the young people are the best teachers of this. Some of you may, may have seen that the um, movie Willy Wonka there's a scene in that that's um, neat where at the end of it, um, and don't want to disappoint you, I'm not going to show you the scene today. If you're thinking that, it's great though. I want you to watch it sometime if you have a chance. At the end of the movie, 
they come into Willy Wonka's office. This is the original one. And like, hey, where's we win this award for doing this? And Willy Wonka yells at him, screams at him like, no, no, get out, get out, get out, get out. What are you talking about? He's, oh, you put your hands on the you know, ceiling of the fizzy lifting drink tower and you left your fingerprints on it. We got to clean it, blah, blah, blah. You get nothing. Get out of here. Get out of here. And he's with his granddad and his granddad's like, you're a fraud. You're a cheat. I can't believe you would do this to, to children. He just screams at Willie Walk and he grabs Charlie up and they're going to walk out. Now, before they had gone to the chocolate factory, a man had grabbed Willy Wonk, uh, grabbed Charlie and said, hey, steal an everlasting gobstopper. And if you give it to me, steal it from Wonka. He's my enemy. I'm his competitor. And give it to me so I can get the formula. I'll give you all this money. So, as there, so go back into the room in the office. Willy Wonka yells at him. The granddad yells back at Willy Wonka, grabs Charlie, and he says, he whispers in his ear, we'll give that man that everlasting gobstopper. And walks out of the room and Charlie stops and he turns around he walks up he takes it out puts it down and says Mr. Wonka and you see Gene Wilder's head kind of bob and he kind of whispers under his breath something about the light in the darkness that he sees in the, in, the, in the generosity of a child. I remember growing up going on a school trip one time. We were stopped at McDonald's. We piled out of the vans. We went into McDonald's. There was a homeless man sitting there, filthy, dirty, asleep, head down, cup of coffee clutched in his hand, half empty, but asleep holding this cup of coffee. You remember these things. Got our food. We're, we're trailing out. There's about eight of us. I was the last one in line. There was someone in front of me. And as they walked past that, that table, it was like right beside them, they, I saw them kind of flinch a little bit and something kind of go onto the table where the man was sleeping. And then the person just kept walking. They didn't look up. Didn't anything. This was a student. And as I walked by, I stopped because I was curious and I looked. And there in the man's matted hair, which was spread all over the table, was a, a wadded up $20 bill that a child had thrown up there. There was no teacher watching. There was no parent watching. They didn't know I was watching. Now, decades later, I remember that. as one of the things that set me on my trajectory. So if you're an elementary school student, if you're a middle school student, if you're a high school student, you have something to teach too to teach your parents, to teach your pastor, to teach your friends about what generosity looks like. You are teachers too, who can give from what little you have. And you can think about that widow who gave those two coins, because you may not have much. So what you give means even more to God, I think. Brothers and sisters, let me just ask you, are you growing in generosity? And if not, then maybe there's a gratitude issue that's really the root of it that can be addressed. We have an opportunity, you might even say responsibility, to send the people off in our lives in a trajectory of generosity to be more and more like Christ, who out of nothing gave everything, gave everything. Is that the trajectory that we are on? Are we growing and allowing God to grow in us? generous hearts. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.